lecture and uh, uh, turn off my video to save some resource. And uh, uh, let me share my screen now. Okay, so so uh, Monday uh, on Tuesday actually on Tuesday uh, we learned um, uh, the autosomal recessive uh, disease in human. So this is an example, and uh, there are some other uh, examples for uh, this kind of disease, uh, the autosomal recessive uh, uh, disorders in human. For example, uh, the CF. Uh, the cystic uh, fibrosis uh, and, and uh, some other disease. All right, so let's uh, uh, look at the second type. So this is, this is so-called the autosomal dominant traits. Uh, so what's the difference between uh, the autosomal dominant traits versus the autosomal uh, recessive uh, traits? Okay, so if you look at the pedigree uh, trees here, family trees here, so you're gonna see the difference. Immediately, you're gonna see the difference. So if this disorder or this trace is a uh, autosomal dominant, you're gonna see uh, the affected individuals appearing in every single generation, right? So typically for the dominant traits, uh, typically uh, the traits, uh, this, tr this kind of traits uh, do not skip generations. You're gonna see every generation, you're gonna see the affected individuals here. Um, so if a parent uh, is, if one parent has uh, uh, the homozygous uh, uh, genotypes for, for this um, trait, uh, you're gonna see uh, for all of, uh, all of the progeny, all, all of the kids from this uh, parent, 100% uh, will carry this, this disease or this, uh, this dominant traits. Uh, if the parent is a heterozygous, so for each, child of this parent, um, uh, there will be 50% uh, of the chance to, to carry, uh, to have this disease, right? Um, All right, so here is an example. This is a very famous example for uh, the, the uh, human autosom autosomal uh, dominant disease, which is the, uh, uh, a, a, a chondroplastic uh, dwarfism. So, so, so this is a one gene disorder. Um, so usually uh, the, uh, in, in the norm normal people, uh, actually the genotype is, uh, homozygous recessive. So this is the normal people, all right? Actually this gene, uh, so this is one gene disorder. Actually this is, this gene is, uh, is, is called the FGFR3. So it's a uh, growth factor receptor uh, gene. Um, so in a normal uh, individual, uh, both alleles are uh, well type. So both alleles can produce the functional protein, uh, which is this this gene and this protein. However, if, a, uh, if there is a single nucleotide mutation like this or this, so this will uh, uh, make one allele uh, non-functional, all right? So even one mutation, uh, so even one of the wild type allele has been mu uh, uh, mutated, this will cause uh, the mutant phenotypes here. So, uh, so in the nature, uh, if you see uh, the phenotype uh, uh, in any uh, individual, so those individuals must be at the heterozygous here, right? In the nature, you cannot, you cannot find any individual uh, uh, with the homozygous uh, uh, mutant because this is lethal uh, genotype and uh, the children, uh, the kid with this kind of genotype cannot be born. So, uh, so this is a very uh, famous example uh, for the human uh, autosomal dominant traits, right? There are some other 
uh, there are some other uh, uh, human uh, disorders or diseases that are uh, that can be categorized in this category, uh, autosomal dominant traits, for example, Alzheimer's disease, All right? Okay, so I think I'm done with the, uh, uh, the previous lecture, uh, let's, uh, um, oops, let's move to the to this lecture. All right. Okay. Okay, so um, so in, in animal, uh, like a human, like in humans or uh, in Drosophila, so uh, everyone knows there are uh, uh, two types of chromosomes, right? There are, uh, there are uh, autos autosomes, for example. So this is the Drosophila genome. So you can see there are autosome here and there are another type of chromosome called the sex chromosome. All right, that's for Drosophila. And for human, the same. So we have like 20, 22 pairs of the autosome and we have one pair of the sex chromosome. So the sex chromosome, uh, usually in most of the animals, yeah, the sex chromosome will determine the sex phenotype uh, in, uh, for any individual in this species, All right? Okay, so we have, last time we have covered uh, the, uh, the human diseases or human, uh, uh, traits that are uh, that are uh, that are controlled by the genes on the autosome. So we call this autosomal uh, recessive uh, phenotypes or autosomal dominant phenotypes, right? So, uh, so for example, uh, in human, uh, the big tone is the longest. This is one phenotype, and this is a autosomal recessive, right? One gene uh, phenotypes here. Uh, so in human. Um, like the uh, uh, six fingers. Uh, um, so this is a, uh, this is a, another uh, uh, the, uh, type of traits. So it is it is uh, called the autosomal dominant because uh, because because uh, the uh, so one allele of this mutant can uh, can cause uh, this this kind of phenotype. So we have learned this before. So this this just gives you a very brief. Uh, review about uh, the autosomal recessive or the autosomal dominant traits in humans. All right. So today, let's let's learn, let's study uh, the molecular mechanism behind this. So why, uh, for some uh, autosomal uh, genes, uh, why um, uh, they can show the autosomal recessive uh, traits, or some some genes can show the uh, autosomal dominant traits. So what is the uh, biochemistry or genetics uh, behind? So this is what we, we, we want to learn today. All right, so here we, uh, we will learn uh, two very important concepts here. So they are very important. Uh, yeah, why is that? Because yeah, I'm gonna, in the future uh, quiz or in the midterms, I'm gonna test you on these two concepts. All right, so one is uh, it, uh, it's called the haplo, sufficient. And the other one is called the haplo insufficient. So let's, let's try to understand this. So what does haplo sufficient mean? So which means like, so we have like, for example, we have two alleles, wild type, big A and big A, all right? So each of these two big capital A allele can produce a functional protein that can lead, uh, which can lead to the normal uh, phenotypes, all right? But for some reason, there's a mutation occurring in one allele, let's say here. So this will become lowercase a, right? All right. However, for this individual, yeah, this, this individual still has, has one functional, uh, functional allele and this, one one copy of the wild type allele is good enough. So even there's only one copy in this individual. So this uh, functional allele can produce enough protein uh, to produce the wild type uh, phenotypes. 
So that call, that, so in this situation, uh, uh, we say this, yeah, this genes and this, uh, this heterozygous uh, genotype is a haplosufficient, right? Okay, now it's, I think yeah, it will be easy for us to understand what, what, what the haploinsufficient means, right? The same thing here, all right? So if, uh, if, yeah, if we have two copies of the wild type, yeah, that's good. This individual will show, let's use capital B here. All right, so this, this, this individual will show the wild type, uh, phenotype, however, if, if mutation occur, occur, occurs here to make this big B into the small B, then something, then the problem can, uh, comes, all right? So, so even this individual has one functional allele, one copy of the, uh, the, uh, the wild type allele, but uh, the protein produced by this one copy of the wild, wild type allele uh, is, not, is not enough to remain the normal uh, phenotypes. So what's the consequence? What happened here? So if uh, one copy, the, the product from the one copy of the wild type of neo cannot remain the, the wild type phenotype, then this individual will show the mutant field, phenotype, right? So which means like one copy of the defective gene allele is sufficient to produce or is sufficient to cause the mutant phenotype, right? So in this case, we call this as the haplo insufficient. Okay, so let me give you an example. This is a very simple model to show the recessive mut mutation, uh, which is the autosomal uh, uh, recessive, and uh, which is uh, corresponding corresponding to uh, the haplo uh, sufficient. All right. So why is that? Because okay, so this is the uh, normal uh, individual. Uh, who has uh, two functional alleles, and each of these two functional alleles can produce some protein, uh, the normal protein, and this, uh, the aggregation of those protein will produce the wild type, phenotype. Okay, that's easy, right? Okay, so if in another individual something happened in one allele, the, there's a, a mutation here, so this mutation will uh, allow uh, the function of this gene, but still this individual has a uh, wild type functional uh, allele here. So, and this allele can produce protein. And uh, even there's one, there's only one allele, but uh, the protein produced by this wild type allele is good enough. So there's a sufficient amount of the protein that can still produce the wild type phenotype for this individual. So, yeah, okay. So these two individuals, although they have different genotype, one is the homozygous uh, wild type, right? The other one is the heterozygous, but they're showing the same phenotypes, okay? However, if we look at the third individual, so if both alleles, wild type alleles have been destroyed, so no protein can be produced in this individual, then there's no functional active a protein enzymes here, and this will lead to the mutant phenotype. Okay. All right, so I hope everybody understand the model behind this, all right? This is a very easy model. So let's look at another one. So this is the, um, the same. So, uh, 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 sorry, this is, this, this is a different model. Okay, so this model shows the haplo insufficient. All right, let's look at uh, this model. So this is the wild type. So this individual, this is a, uh, a normal individual. Uh, so this individual has two functional alleles, wild type, and both of these two alleles, both alleles can produce uh, one uh, dose of the protein here. And the uh, aggregation of this uh, product, the protein can produce the wild type phenotypes here, all right? However, uh, if uh, both alleles are mutant, so none of this, uh, neither one can produce 
can, can produce uh, uh, anything, cannot produce anything. So there's no functional protein for this individual that you're gonna see uh, the mutant, mutant phenotypes here. However, if we look at the heterozygous individual, so this individual has one wild type allele and one mutant allele. And the, the wild type allele can produce one dose uh, one, uh, one dose of the protein, but this one dose is not good enough. It's not enough in, uh, to, to, to remain the wild type phenotypes for the cell or for the individual. So for this heterozygous individual, guess what happened? So you still see the mutant phenotypes for this one. So this is an example to show the haploinsufficient uh, traits. Okay, so let's look at the uh, the the dominant. So 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 for uh, the haploinsufficient, so there are uh, multiple ways. Uh, uh, there are, there are multiple uh, uh, types of um, uh, phenotypes. So let's look look into this. So one type of the dominant mutation or the haploinsufficient is. Uh, is is caused is caused by the uh, um, gain of function. So this mutation will uh, will will lead to the gain of function. So for example, this is a wild type. The first one, the first individual is the wild type. So this individual has two wild type alleles. Each each uh, each of these two will produce one portion of the protein, and the, the, the uh, aggregation of this protein will will produce the the wild type phenotypes here. So this is wild type. Okay, so what is the wild type? What, so in this example, what is the wild type phenotype? So wild type phenotype means like, okay, so those are functional protein, but this protein cannot uh, do cannot do anything without uh, activation. So uh, so this protein needs some something else, some other mo molecules or the chemicals uh, to activate them. So the phenotype for this protein is actually switchable. So they, they, they were produced there, but they initially they cannot do any function in the cell uh, unless uh, there's some other molecules or chemicals attached to them and to activate them. So, so the phenotype of this type is switchable. Okay, so now look at the second individual. So if uh, for one allele, there's a mutation. So this mu mutation will cause what? So it will cause, interestingly, so it, it will cause like, uh, so the, this mutant, the mutant allele will produce a protein uh, which is already on. So which which does not need any uh, activation from other chemicals or molecules. So this will immediately give this individual a new phenotype. So, so the, the protein is always on. So so even one mutation, a mu mutant allele can can produce a new uh, uh, phenotype, right? Uh, the mutant phenotype. All right. So this is called the dominant mutation. And this is because, because of the gain of function. Right. And of course, if you look at the third individual, so both alleles are mutant. And so this individual will have a different phenotype, the mutant phenotype here, mutant and mutant. Okay. All right, so this is one way gain of function. And also, the dominant uh, mutation can cause uh, uh, can cause the uh, the loss of function. So we call this kind of dom uh, a mutation as the dominant and negative mutation because it it causes the uh, it causes a loss of function in the cell or uh, in, in any individual. So, for example, this is a, a, a classical human example. Uh, so. Uh, uh, Hemoglobin. So this this gene actually produced the hemoglobin, and okay. So in a, in a wild type, uh, in a normal uh, individual, so this individual has two wild type alleles here, and each one can produce uh, the uh, the functional protein, and this protein need to be for so so this protein need to form a, a tetramer. So see. The four particles or four proteins get together to form a complex. So this complex is called, is called the tetramer. 
tetramers because it, it consists of four uh, identical uh, proteins produced by this gene, right? Okay. All right. Only, only this kind of a tetramer is functional, so it's active and carry oxygen, or for example. All right. Okay, so this will show, this individual will show the wild type phenotypes. However, let's see what happens. So if, if there's one allele uh, has been mutated, so this is a mutant allele, and still we have one. So in this, in, the, in this individual, we have one wild type allele, and we have one mutant allele. The wild type allele will produce the wild type protein, but the mutant allele will produce the mutant allele, and they are mixed together in the cell. And the chance uh, is very high to form a complex a tetramer, uh, something uh, like this, right? So it's a mixture. It's, it's a, actually is a mixture of uh, the wild type uh, protein and the mutant protein. So if this is the case, so none of this complex. All right, so this will gives you the mutant phenotypes here. The same thing here, all right? So this autosomal dominant traits, mutation dominant traits, uh, will give you a negative, negative, negative uh, uh, mutation uh, disorder uh, because <clears throat> the mutation will cause uh, loss of function. Of the gene. Professor, yeah. Could you describe to so the the slide before that was also a dominant mutation, but that was gain of function. So could you just like, could you? You mean the previous one? Yeah, this one. What's oh the, yeah, sure. Yeah. What so what's the like the main difference is that it'll, um, so this one will have a gain of function, but the protein will still be, sorry, the the final like protein will still be like functional. Right. So okay. Yeah, so, so yeah, it's a little bit tricky between these two, right? So let me, uh, uh, yeah, so let me uh, repeat this two slides <clears throat> to make it clear. All right, so here the mutation is called the gain of function is Y because, all right, so this is the wild type. The phenotype for the, the, the wild type phenotype is, is, is such that uh, this protein produced by the wild type alleles uh, will be switchable. What does a uh, switchable mean? Means okay, so those proteins cannot uh, function by itself. Uh, it it need to be switched on by something else, right? So some other molecules or uh, chemicals. All right, this is we can treat this as a phenotype. So the phenotype itself is the protein is being uh, switchable. Okay. Now, if there's a function, there's a mutation occurring here. So uh, such that. So this mutant allele will produce a protein. The protein, the protein is already on. It, it doesn't need any uh, 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 any activation. It doesn't need to be switched switched uh, switched on because it is already on. So this one can immediately doing something in the in the cell, right? But this one cannot. So it needs something activated to do the same thing. So that means okay. So this mutation. Uh, will cause the gain of function. Okay, got it. Thank you. So sure. just like makes that is that only specific to phenotypes that are like switchable? So this is like the only example. Uh, yeah, the, the, yeah. This is not the only example, but this is the only example in this class. So okay. yeah, yeah, if you if you are, are interested in this, yeah, this is very interesting. <clears throat> you can search online to see if uh, if there are some other type of uh, phenotypes in humans also showing the same mechanism. So there are many kinds of like phenotypes uh, mm -hmm. that can fit, fit in this kind of categories, the, the dominant mutation, uh, which is associated with a uh, gain of function. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. <clears throat> okay, yeah, very good question. So this, yeah, the, the difference between this one and this one is, they are the same. They are they, they are showing the same category, which is the haploinsufficient, right? So one uh, mut mutant will mutant allele will 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 make uh, the mutant uh, uh, phenotypes. However, the difference between these two is like so for this one, the mutation will help uh, the individual or cells gain to gain some function, but here the mutation will suppress function of a, a gene. 
or uh, which means like the mutation will uh, will cause the individual or cells uh, to lose some function. Hi, Professor. Oh, sorry. Just to clarify. So, um, mm -hmm. once again, the gain of function is basically kind of like a like a good mutation because it turns on the function of the phenotype, correct? And then, um, interesting question. Sometimes yes, but sometimes no. So maybe uh -huh. I think the nature uh, make make this way the wild type this way is sometimes yeah we don't want this gene to be expressed in any time, right? We just want the genes to be expressed in a specific time. Right? So if it is always on, sometimes yeah, it may cause some problems. So oh, this okay, is, I see. Good question. Yeah, okay. the gain function, uh, sometimes it is a good thing, but sometimes maybe it's not a good thing. Okay, all right, perfect, thank you. Sure. But yeah, itself is a, a phenotype. So we, we just talk about the phenotype and the, the mutation. Uh, uh, and the relationship between the mutation and the phenotype, right? Mm. Okay. All right, so this table just gives you a summary about uh, uh, the possible, uh, oops, okay. The possible cause of phenotypes, all kinds of uh, causes, and, uh, and, uh, and it will tell you like which one could be dominant and which one, which one could be uh, recessive, right? Okay. Now, uh, when we talk about the uh, phenotypes, the, uh, here uh, we, we have two more important concepts here. So those two, two impo uh, those two concepts are also very important. Yeah, when I say they, they are important, yeah, they, 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 yeah, they're really important because they're going to show up in your, uh, in your midterms or in your future quiz. Okay, the penetrance and the ex expressivity. Okay, so when we talk about the phenotypes, phenotype. So we need to talk about the penetrance and the expressivity. All right, so what, 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 the, what do these two uh, concepts mean? So let's look at this. All right, so for example, this is a classical, uh, uh, experiment, uh, just like uh, Mr. Mandel did, right? So we have one gene um, phenotype and there are two. So this is a simple model. We only have like two alleles, two alleles for this gene. So the big B is the dominant related with, uh, in relation to the, the lowercase b, all right? So the phenotype is like, so the, the big B, the dominant will produce some uh, pigments. Uh, for example, the purple pigments. Uh, so th that means like in this, this cell or this individual carrying this genotype uh, will give you uh, the purple phenotypes or uh, in the flower, let's think about the flower. So that's the pigment. And the, uh, the, the homozygous, the homozygous uh, lower, lower case B and B uh, will give you nothing because uh, they cannot produce any purple pigment. So this is uh, the nature of this one gene and two alleles. And if we uh, if we cross these two parents, the inbred lines, one is the homozygous big B, big B, and the other one is the homozygous little b, little b. So we're going to generate F1 population, which the progeny of which will be all uniform. Uh, uh, like this, right? The genotypes should be heterozygous, big B and small b. So based on our previous knowledge, we would expect to see, for example, all, all this F1 population should show one phenotype, which is the purple, right? Because, because the genotypes are identical, they are heterozygous, big B and small b. But in reality, sometimes not all F1 progeny uh, show the dominant phenotype, for example. So only part of the, only a, a, a proportion of the F1 progeny showing the expected phenotype, but some showing uh, the other phenotype. So, so if this is the case, so this, this F1 uh, progeny population uh, have the same identical genotype, which is big B and small b. They should, I mean, they should have shown uh, uniform 
purple phenotypes, right? But uh, in reality, uh, sometimes they do not. You, you see only a, a partial of the progeny showing the phenotypes. So we call this variable, variable penetrance, right? So this, this is the one concept. The penetrance, penetrance actually in, is defined as in a population of individuals with the same genotype. In this case, we have the same genotypes here, big B and small b. Uh, the percentage who exhibit the phenotype, uh, the expected phenotype uh, for that genotype is called the penetrance rate, right? Okay, so this is the first example. So let's look at the second example. So this is the first example. Let's look at the second example. So still we cross these two in breadline parents uh, to generate the F1 population. But in this case, all the F1 progeny showing uh, the phenotype, the purple, but, uh, but not at the same levels, not, but not, like, not at the same level. As you can see, so the, in this diagram, it shows like some are more purple, some are uh, a little bit uh, less purple, more light, light purple. So if this is the case, uh, we will say, okay, so in this population, uh, there, are, there is a uh, variable, variable expressivity, all right? So, so the concept for the express, expressivity is uh, for a given genotype, the degree to which phenotype is expressed. This is, uh, this is the definition for the expressivity, right? And in the third example here, showing this diagram, yeah, you're gonna see both, right? You're gonna see the variable uh, penetrance rate and also the variable expressivity. All right, I hope, yeah, it is clear. So uh, yeah, th those two concepts are very important. Okay, so why is that? So why is that? So again, so let's look at uh, the penetrance and, uh, or, and the expressivity. Okay. So uh, if you do not see everybody uh, in the F1 uh, progeny showing uh, the expected phenotypes, that means uh, there's an incomplete uh, penetrance, right? Not all uh, the individual of the same genotype uh, show uh, the expected phenotype or a variable expressivity. So, so even uh, all the individuals in this progeny, F1 progeny showing the, the the expected phenotypes, but they, uh, this phenotype is not expressed uniformly or in an identical level. So we say, okay, variable expressivity. So why is that? So this is because what? This is because of the interaction between genotypes and the environment. So we have mentioned this before, right? Okay, I hope you, uh, you all watched this old movie, the Zootopia. So this is a this is a very a fun movie, and I yeah that's my favorite movie. Um, so I, I yeah I would like to use this as an example to show you why uh, the phenotype is the is the consequence or is the product uh, from uh, the interaction between the genotypes and the environmental factors. So okay, okay. so the phenotypes ideally like when we when we use the uh, the Mendelian model. So when we study the Mendelian examples. So that's the ideal situation. So, uh, uh, so we rule out any environmental factors. Uh, so in that case, uh, the genotypes will determine the phenotype, right? However, in reality, this is not the case. So it, the, the phenotypes you observe is always the outcome from the interaction between the genotypes and the environment, right? So for example, uh, uh, so, so actually, some animals like the rabbit, they are very nice in nature. However, if you change the environment, so for example, there's a magic flower, uh, this magic flower can produce some magical pollen uh, grains, and uh, if, uh, if somehow like the pollen uh, get to the, the rabbit, it can change the nature uh, of, of the rabbit. So, so this is an example uh, to show, okay, any phenotypes, Oops, okay, it's here. And the phenotypes observed is actually the outcome from both the genotypes, genetics, and the environment. All 
All right, although the genotypes is the major player, so usually the phenotypes is mainly uh, determined by the genotypes, but it also uh, may, may, may be influenced by the environment. So this is example. So if you uh, have time to look at this solve the problem example in chapter two, so this will give you a very, very good uh, example idea how uh, the, uh, the phenotypes is, is a outcome uh, from the interaction between the genes and the, and the environments. Okay, so let me quickly go over this problem with you. So this is a fun problem. So many years ago, some people uh, did, a, uh, did a very interesting experiment. So uh, in this experiment, they have two inbred lines, uh, rabbits. Okay. I will still use a rabbit as an example here. Okay, so this is one gene phenotype. So one parent rabbit, they produce this parent, uh, it produced only uh, the white fat, white fat, W, W, big W. And another line, a bright line, so this parent always produced the yellow fat, so use the Lowercase w w. All right, all right. If if we cross, yeah, they, they cross these two parents to generate the F one uh, progeny. So obviously, right? This is this is a typical like Mendelian Mendelian uh, design. So uh, if if this is one gene uh, trait, and if uh, there are only two alleles, one is dominant and one is recessive. So you're gonna see in the progeny uh, in the F one progeny. Everybody will show the same, the dominant phenotype. Wow, the, the white, the white fat. Okay, now, uh, it, it, uh, so they did the, uh, the, the, uh, the cross among this F1 progenies, and then, yeah, it will give you, it, th this gave them a very classic uh, Mendelian phenotypes ratio. So look at here, so three, two, one. So beautiful. So now everybody knows this, right? So this is a classical Mendelian design. So in this case, we can use a two by two Hunnic square to help us understand why there's a three to one ratio, right? So this is a three to one ratio. Okay, beautiful. However, uh, years later, someone want to repeat this experiment. Uh, say, so, those people uh, years later, so they use the same parent lines here, the same line. And for the F1, yeah, the same, okay? This, this is what expect to see, what we expect to see, what they expect to see. However, when they do the cross among this F1 progeny, so what happened is here, so they only see the, the white fat uh, rabbits in the F2 progeny. Uh, so they never see, the, so the, they expected uh, the yell, uh, yellow fat rabbits are gone, so disappeared. So why is that? Is the Mondinian law, uh, is, is there something wrong with the Mondinian law? Or, so actually, yeah, this, this, is, this can be explained by, the, uh, by what we have just mentioned. So the phenotypes you see is actually the outcome, joint outcome from uh, the interaction between the, between the genetics gene and the environment. All right, the only difference between the, the first experiment and the second experiment, so this is the first experiment and the second experiment uh, years ago, uh, years after. So the difference between them is like, uh, the, in the first experiment, uh, the people use uh, the fresh vegetables to feed those uh, rabbits. But uh, years later, uh, in the second experiment, they use the pr processed food uh, to feed this rabbit. So when they look into those uh, differences, they see, they, they immediately identify that. So in the fresh vegetable, there's, a, there's something called, called this. So yeah, I don't want to pronounce this. So this is too hard for me. Okay, so some, some chemical, yeah, in, this, uh, in, in the fresh vegetable. So this chemical shows uh, the orange color or the yellow color, okay? Uh, so, and uh, this gene, the wild type gene, the, 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 the capital W, so, if this is a wild type, it can uh, produce a, a protein or enzyme that can break down, break down this chemical. 
So the wild type allele, the big W, will produce functional enzyme uh, which can break down this yellow thing. And then the, 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 the rabbit uh, carrying this type of allele uh, will produce the uh, white fat. However, the mutant, the, the, sm the small W, small W, so those are mutant alleles, they do not, they cannot produce functional uh, enzyme uh, in those individuals. And that's why, so in those, in those rabbits, they, they cannot break down this yellow uh, substance. And this will be deposited in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the fat. So showing the yellow color fat. So this is the reason why is that, all right? Okay, so, so, so they, second time, one, one day uh, figure out this. So they repeated this experiment and fit those rabbit again using the fresh red, uh, vegetables. And yeah, they successfully restored the classical ratio three to one. So this is a very interesting example, a beautiful story to show uh, why uh, uh, you, we cannot always think like the genotype will definitely completely or 100% uh, determine um, the phenotypes, no. So, so any phenotype will be affected by both genetic factors and the environmental factors. I, I hope, yeah, this is, a, this, this is clear and everybody can understand. Uh, in the future, when you take some uh, careers um, uh, uh, in genetics, so so you have to think about. So if you see some interesting mutant phenotypes, or if you see some uh, interesting outcomes, uh, you need to think about both the genetics and the environments. Okay. All right. So um, so what? Uh, so next topic about the chromosome. In the first lecture, we, uh, we, uh, we mentioned that in the history of genetics, Morgan, Morgan is a very important figure uh, uh, to, uh, for developing the, the current the modern genetics system, right? And the Morgan uh, is the person who uh, identified that the DNA, uh, the genetic, material or genes are located on the chromosome. All right, after that, so there are a bunch of like chromosome theory. So first, chromosome uh, carries the uh, stuff. Uh, uh, so chromosome is the place where the genetic inheritance uh, uh, factors are located, right? So this is the first uh, theorem for chromosome. And also they found, uh, researchers found chromosome uh, can play a, a very important role in sex determination. So in the early days, so those are the uh, important and the creati uh, creative observations uh, in the genetic experiment. So first, um, the, re uh, research, uh, the, the previous researchers observed chromosome numbers, chromosome numbers in organism will be constant, in, in, any, in any organism will be constant. And the chromosome numbers between species will not be constant. So that's, that, that's why they are different species because uh, they are different in terms of the chromosome numbers. And the sperm or eggs are the nuclear uh, sex. And um, sometimes, uh, not, not in, in most of the, in most of the case, in, uh, so in, in most of the case in animals, the sex phenotype uh, is correlated with the chromosome morphology or the number of chromosomes. Okay, so now we're gonna move into this topic. Okay, so sex chromosome in human. Um, okay, first, let me give you, give you another new concept. So this is another important concept here. So called the, oops, hemizygous. Okay, this is new, right? This is new. Okay, so so previously we learned homozygous and heterozygous. That's easy because when we talk about either homozygous or heterozygous, we are talking about what? We are talking about uh, two homologous chromosomes. So those are the two homologous chromosomes, right? And at the same locus, 
the two homologous chromosomes uh, carries uh, carry the same identical gene, but this gene can take different forms. All right, all right. So if, for example, in this case, so if this gene at this locus uh, have identical allele on these two homologous chromosomes, then we say this individual is a homozygous. If at this locus, at the same gene, have different allele, so one is red and one is blue, then we say, okay, so this individual is a heterozygous individual. Okay, but in some time, and some, in some cases, sometimes like um, in one chromosome, uh, there's, a, there's a gene there, but in another chromosome, there's no gene, there's, there, there's no such a gene there. So if this is the case, we say uh, this one, this, this gene is a hemizygous, missing one. Okay, let me remove this. Um, yes. sir, I've got a quick question. Yeah. So um, for hemizygous um, chromosomes, mm -hmm. when say we're, we're putting, we're putting uh, that uh, genotype into a, into a uh, into a Punnett square, uh, mm -hmm. would it be that we're seeing the uh, one pair of big R big R and another pair that's a small R small R, for example, or is it just going to be one pair of big R big R and only that genotype is going to be expressed because only that yeah the second one the the, the latter one so because the because yeah if you want to put so put this case in the uh, it's funny square right this is a good question. So only one parent, uh, let's say this parent. So this parent can produce a big R here, but nothing here, you put zero here because there's no such thing, right? And yeah. for, this, for, for this parent, the same, you, you have a big R. If, if two parents are of the same genotype, you're gonna put a zero here. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, okay, so, um, yeah, I figured that. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, okay. All right, so so this hemizygous uh, often occurs in the sex chromosome, but sometimes it can also occur uh, in the autosome. Because imagine like in the autosome, if, if so those, for example, if, if these are the autosome, so one, one gene is okay, but for one, uh, for the other chromosome, if something happened here, deletion, in the future we're gonna we're gonna learn the, the chromosome or genome deletion. If the deletion uh, remove removes this this region, so this will cause the hemizygous, right? So, but this case is usually is not that common. But the common thing is like in a sex chromosome, in a human chromosome, you're gonna see this is very common. Why? Because okay, that, so this is. The X chromosome and this is the Y chromosome. Uh, as you can see, the Y chromosome is much, much significantly shorter than the X chromosome. So why is that? Because Y chromosome carries a significantly less genes than X chromosome. So if you look at, if you compare the X chromosome versus Y chromosome, uh, you only see uh, two regions. Okay, so at, at, at the tip regions, so here and here, the red region, so those two regions are uh, very similar to each other. Uh, so we can say these two regions are the pseudo autosomal uh, region because uh, in this region, uh, X chromosome and Y chromosome uh, ca carry very similar genes, almost identical genes. All right, the same for this tip. So if you look at this tip and this tip, this blue region, X chromosome and Y chromosome uh, carry carry very similar genes in this region as well. But if you look at the majority of the X and the majority of the Y, they are different. So they carry totally different genes. That's why we call this, these regions are the differential region of, uh, of the Y chromosome. And this pink uh, region is the differential region of the X, chrom X chromosome and any genes uh, that is uh, that are in this region, we call this X-linked genes because the, the inheritance pattern for those genes will be uh, associated with the presence of X chromosome, right? And also, 
here, the Y linked genes are in this region because this, those genes are spe specifically for Y chromosome. Only Y chromosome has those genes. And if we want to study the inheritance pattern for those genes, those phenotypes are always associated with the presence of the Y chromosome. Okay, for example, so if we look at here, so this green, bar, green bar here, so that's that's the gene, uh, uh, that's the gene uh, determining uh, the male list uh, in human. So we call this gene SRY, and this gene is in the differential region of the Y, and this gene is Y-linked gene. Uh, there's not there's 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 not such a gene uh, on the X chromosome, right? Okay, so so given this, so in human, so how do we define uh, determine a sex for for an individual in humans? So we use the so in human in humans, so the presence of Y chromosome will determine the male list and the absence of the Y chromosome determines the female list, right? So for example, so this is the standard uh, uh, case genotypes here. So uh, XX, this individual does not have a Y chromosome. So we define this one, uh, a female. So this is standard uh, genotypes. Uh, and for the, for the uh, standard male, so uh, as you can see, XY, so there's a one Y there, right? Y chromosome. So the presence of Y chromosome will determine uh, the male list, male list of, of the humans. So look at some non-standard uh, uh, case. So for this one, this individual uh, only has one X chromosome um, because, because there's no Y chromosome. So we define this one as a female. And if we look at this individual, there are two X chromosomes, but one Y chromosome, right? So we, we do not worry about how many X chromosomes this individual has. We only see if there's, a, if there's a Y chromosome or not, because in humans or mammals, in most of the mammals and the humans, we determine uh, the sex by uh, using the criteria, whether the Y is present or not, all right? So this is an important thing for uh, mammals and humans. So now we, when we look at the Drosophila, so this is different. Don't be confused. So different organism may use totally, completely different mechanism to determine sex. All right. So when we look at uh, look into the Drosophila, the fruit flies, all right? Oops. So sex in fruit flies, Drosophila, will be determined by the number of X chromosome in relation to the autosome in the individual. Or in another way, we, we will look into the ratio of X chromosome to the autosome, okay? So this is different, yeah, and this is very important. Because and understanding this will make you earn a lot of points in the midterms. All right, so this is very important. So Make sure you understand there's a different mechanism. There, there, there are different mechanisms, different ways for us to determine sex in humans, mammals versus Drosophila, right? Okay, let's look at the Drosophila. So the, the female, the female, the standard female Drosophila has two X chromosomes and the two sets of autosomes. So one A represents a single set of autosomes. So there are two sets and there are two X chromosomes. All right, so if you calculate the ratio of X chromosomes versus the autosome, so that gives you what? One, right? Because we have two X and we have two sets of autosome, two A. So this gives you one, ratio one. So if this ratio equals to one, that gives you the female, the software. All right, let's look at the female, uh, the male. This is a standard, male Drosophila. So uh, in this individual, it has one X chromosome and one Y chromosome. Okay, the same. So this individual has two sets of autosome. So 
Now, here we do not check whether this individual has X chromosome or not. Uh, sorry. So we do not check whether this individual has a Y chromosome or not, right? Because that's the way we, uh, uh, we use for human uh, sex determination. But here we do not worry about the Y chromosome. We just calculate X and the autosome ratio. So in this case, this gives you, there's one X, but two A. So this will gives you one half, point, point 0.5. I hope it's clear. So yeah, this is a little bit messy. Let me remove this. Okay, so, so when we calculate the ratio of X and A, so this standard uh, female gives you uh, one, the ratio equals to one, and this standard male gives you the ratio equals to one and a, one half. All right, now look at here. So this one, this is a, a non-standard one. So this one only has one X chromosome, but the other one uh, missing. So just one X chromosome, we use X O to represent this. And the same, this one also carries um, two sets of autosomes. So when we calculate the ratio of this one, gives you the same point, point 0.5, right? So that means like this one is a male. But see the difference between this one, be, between Drosophila and the, and the human. In human, this will give you uh, a female, female list, right? But in Drosophila, this one will give you a male list. So this is different. Okay, and it, it is very important because I hope everyone understand this. Okay, now, so you can, you can do your math. So, so you can, for example, this one gives you one. So even there's a Y chromosome here, but we, it doesn't matter. So if you just calculate the ratio of X and A, so this, this gives you one and this is the female. All right, so there are some very uh, nice standard uh, versions of the Drosophila. Uh, will give you something called the meta female or meta male. Uh, so those are uh, the phenotypes uh, uh, called the super female or super male, uh, which are uh, which have very low vi viability at Josophler. Um, but yeah, but uh, as I mentioned in Josophler, so we uh, determine uh, their sex uh, not based on the presence of Y chromosomes, which, which is for human beings. Uh, but for your software, we, we need to calculate the ratio of X chromosomes versus autosomes. I hope this is clear. All right. Okay, so yeah. What is the O, the sex chromosome complement? There was an O. Hmm. You mean here, right? The O? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Okay, O means like missing. So you, okay. so you, you can say just X so uh, to, to reduce the confusion. So, so so for this one, there's only one chromosome there, X chromosome. O means like empty. Okay, and did we have to, um, we just have to memorize the values, right? Uh, memorize what, I'm sorry? The values, like the one, like which ratio leads to which phenotype. Uh, uh, so yeah, so you, you, I think you, you have to only memorize uh, uh, two numbers. So, okay, so one, gives you the female, right? Uh, 0 0.5 gives you the male, uh, uh, but uh, uh, anything uh, uh, greater than one will give you a female as well. And uh, anyone uh, smaller than 0 0.5 will gives you a super male. So the 0 0.5 and one is, is the two cutoff that you, you need to memorize. And in the test, I will not test you uh, on very complicated situation. I will, I, probably I will give you a very standard uh, is to, to let you uh, determine the sex for the individual uh, to software. All right, any other questions here? Okay, perfect. All right, let's 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 look at uh, the, the sex determination in box. So in box, it's, it's, it, it, yeah, it's, it's a little bit different. So this is different from humans, mammals, and uh, for, it's also different from to software. So in box, uh, they only have one types of sex chromosome. They only have X chromosome. They do not have uh, other sex chromosome in, in a different uh, uh, morphology. So, but how, how do they uh, 
uh, differentiate uh, 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 the, the male and the females. Okay, so they use the number of X chromosomes to determine the male list or female list. So for example, uh, in a female uh, bug, so uh, there are two X chromosomes, but in a male bugs, there's only one X chromosome. So what's the difference here? So the difference is like, if you look at the female bug, so when this bug uh, is producing uh, gametes, uh, the, the female bug will produce uh, uh, gametes of the same morphology. So we call this homogametic. Homogametic means like, um, um, so, uh, so, 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 uh, so the, uh, the individual uh, will only produce one types of gametes. So in terms of the morphology, right? Because if you look at here, so uh, if, uh, based on the Mendelian laws, uh, if we just divided this uh, genome into two, so the female bugs will produce just one type of gamete. However, if you look at the, the male bug, it can produce two types of gametes. One is uh, just 6A autosome. The other one is 6A plus A X chromosome, okay? But for female, you, you only see the 6A plus X. So in this case, we say the female bugs are the homogametic and the male bugs is the heterogametic. And if you use the, something like the Pani square, so this is not a square because because uh, the female can only produce one gamete, one type of gametes, right? Uh, the male can produce two gametes. So we, we will use this like something like the Pani square, the one by two. Uh, you can see, so from this cross, the progeny, half of the progeny will be a, a male and the half of the progeny will be the female. So they're using this kind of mechanism to keep the sex ratio one to one. Yeah, generation by generation. Okay, so this is a uh, this is example in in birth. So it's it's it, it's very different. Yeah, it's different. Okay, so in birds, um, uh, the male birds are the homo gametic. So this is uh, different from human, right? In human, uh, the male is like X, Y. So human, uh, in human male is the homogametic, but um, in birds, uh, uh, that daddy is the homogametic one. So it carries two uh, Z sex chromosomes and, and the female, the mom, will carry uh, two different sex chromosomes. One is Z and one is W. So, so, so in this case, we. So yeah, we can still use the Pandit square to, to, to generate uh, uh, the expected progeny from this cross. As you can see, half of the, half of the progeny from this cross uh, will be male and half of the progeny from this cross will be female. And this will keep the sex ratio to as one to one, All right? And this table just gives you a, uh, Summarize a summary about uh, uh, the sex the, the sex determination using uh, sex chromosomes in different organisms. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now, so so here. So remember, this is the first type. First type, because uh, in the previous in the previous examples, I just show you how in different organisms the sex chromosomes will help determine. Uh, sex for each individual, right? So this is one way uh, the sex is determined by the sex chromosome. However, there are some other mechanisms in, in animals and in the nature that can also uh, 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 help determine the sex. So for example, uh, in the in ants, bees or wasps, right? They do not have sex chromosome. Then how can they, how can they, uh, separate uh, male from the female, right? So they do not have sex chromosomes. They only have the autosomes. So then how do they organize their society? <laughs> so they use a different mechanism here. So not using the sex chromosome because they do not have sex chromosomes. 
they use the ploidy, difference in ploidy to determine sex phenotypes. So for example, the female is always 2N diploid and, and the male is always 1N haploid. All right, so this is a little bit different. So make sure you understand the difference between this category and the category we just mentioned, first one, using the sex chromosome to, to determine the phenotypes. So here in ants, in bees and the wasps, they do not have sex chromosome. So they use different ploidy to determine sex phenotypes. And in fungi, uh, so, in the, so, so last time I asked you to read textbook to make sure you understand the life cycle for this, uh, for yeast and for the or, or for neurospora, because this is very important. In the future, uh, we are gonna leverage this, this most useful, beautiful, uh, model organism to help us to do a lot of genetic di dissections. And uh, we, we also will use this model to help us to do the uh, genetic mapping. So, so hopefully everyone can, 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 can take some time to read textbook. Uh, yeah, it's important and it's fun to read. Yeah, I know everyone is busy. Uh, if you do not have time to read textbook, uh, then uh, make some time to read, read your textbook. So it, it, it will be fun and it's important for this class, All right? Okay, so in fungi, they, uh, they do not have sex chromosomes. So, and they do not use the, a different ploidy because they, all of them are haploid. So they, they cannot use the, the, the difference in diploid, uh, uh, ploidy to, to determine uh, sex phenotypes. So how do they do? They use a gene, a single gene, they use a allele, different allele for a gene to determine the mating system. Okay, so this is a little bit different. So yeah, read the textbook, make sure you understand that. So this is another uh, mechanism. And uh, so this is even more interesting, <laughs> all right? The envir environmental sex determination or temperature sex determinations. So in some uh, reptiles, like, like in this diagram, so you're gonna see, right? Uh, those, uh, those animals, they do not. So um, for those animals, the sex determination is, uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, the sex is determined, sex phenotypes is determined by uh, a specific hormone. So for example, uh, okay. So X hormone, hormone eggs can give, uh, can give the rise to the female, uh, female uh, reptile. And another hormone, Y, can give rise to the male reptile. But these two hormones cannot be produced at the same time. And the production of these two uh, different hormones depend on the environmental factor, for example, temperature, right? So if temperature below 30 Celsius degree here, then only X chromosomes is produced. I believe this is, uh, this is, this is for probably for uh, the, uh, the turtles here, yeah. So different reptile probably, yeah, use different, uh, use different uh, temperature mechanism. So for example, in, uh, in the turtles, so if uh, temperature is below uh, 30 Celsius degree, uh, then only X chromosomes is it, gonna uh, be pr produced and all the progeny will be, uh, uh, will be uh, female, yes, okay. Then as the temperature rise, so if the temperature rise above 30, above, above 30, or maybe, maybe, maybe uh, this is for uh, alligators, I think, yeah. So the, yeah, this, this, this example is for the alligators. So if the temperature rise above 30 Celsius degree, and then, uh, then the, X, the, 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 the gene uh, that produced X hormone uh, will be turned off and only Y chromosome is gonna be produced resulting in the males. Okay, so this is another mechanism uh, in some animals to determine sex phenotype. So it's very interesting. Uh, professor? Yeah. Uh, so since it says environmental sex determination, is, is that to say that there are other fa um, environmental factors that can affect uh, sex determination other than temperature? Yes, 
I believe so, but but uh, but uh, but I don't I don't know exactly. So yeah, this is a good topic. So if you are interested, you can search online to see. Yeah, uh, I believe there are some other can uh, can affect the sex determination as well in some specific animals. Uh, but temperature probably yeah uh, is a major one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So then, um, just uh, just for the class, then um, should should we know uh, how temperatures specifically affect sex determination just for now? Uh, I think, yeah, this is good enough. I, I don't remember I put any questions on my previous <laughs> exams uh, testing you about this, because usually I, I'm going to test you uh, how you use sex chromosome to determine the, the male list or female list. But yeah, this is only for your information. So in, environmental factors. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thank you. This is the fun part, but not, not required. <laughs> the, 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 the required part is for uh, the first category. So here we have four categories, right? So the, this is the four, uh, number four category, so which, is, uh, sh which is showing how environmental factors can determine sex uh, phenotypes, but this is not required. Uh, pay attention to the first category. So in different organisms like in humans and mammals or uh, uh, the Drosophilus, so how uh, you can use uh, the sex chromosomes to determine uh, sex phenotypes for in, for each individual. Yeah, that's the important thing. Okay, so I think you're like about five minutes. Let me. So uh, yeah, I have two slides. So we're we pretty good. We're doing very good. So this is the Punnett squares, all right? So we use uh, uh, Drosophila uh, uh, to as an example to show uh, the, the 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 pattern and how the sex ratio is. Uh, is kept uh, in one to one from uh, a generation to generation. Okay, now so the last slide just gives you a, a, a brief story. So we're gonna uh, repeat this story, this experiment next time because this is a very important example. So uh, Morgan did a, uh, a very interesting uh, experiment on Drosophila, and uh, he this experiment ha helped him uh, won a, a Nobel Nobel Prize. Uh, in 1934. Uh, 30, uh, um, all right. So what what he what he did is like in the first cross because at the beginning. So, so so first in this experiment, uh, this experiment helped him to identify some X-linked genes. So this gene is not like before we learned. Okay, so this gene is in, in the past we learned some genes are located on the older zone. So the inheritance inheritance pattern of those phenotypes. Does, does not depend on the, uh, the, uh, the sex uh, phenotype, right? But this phenotype is associated with uh, the Drosophila sex phenotypes, all right? So this is the color, eye color here, red and white. <clears throat> so in his, ex in his experiment, he did the first cross. Uh, so in the first cross, uh, he crossed one parent, female, with the, uh, with the uh, wild type, dominant uh, red eyes, and with a male, um, which is the mutant, like the white eyes. And uh, okay, so as he expected, because at that time, at the beginning, he didn't know this one is on X chromosome, it's, it's linked to X chromosome. So he just expect, expect to see uh, all the uh, progeny, F1 progeny showing the same phenotype. Yes, this is what he observed, right? And uh, okay, so he, he, he kept doing, he kept doing uh, to generate F2 population from crossing the F1 population. And uh, he, he observed the classical three to one ratio. Wow, bingo. So this is classical Mendelian ratio here. But however, when he did the second cross, he just swept, switched. The, the, the parent rows. So, so now this time the female carries uh, the mutant uh, phenotypes, the, the white eyes, uh, and the male has the wild type like red eyes. And the one crossing this two parents. So in F1, he observed the segregation of the phenotypes. Half of the well, uh, F1 progeny showing the wild type and half of the uh, progeny showing uh, the, the, the mutant type. and 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 interestingly, like all the all the wild type uh, wild type uh, uh, F one progeny are female, and all the 
a mutant type of the uh, F1 progeny are male. And uh, he, he kept doing uh, uh, the cross to generate F2 population. And uh, he didn't see the classical three to one ratio. So by doing this, he figured out. So this gene is associated with sex chromosome. All right, I think I'm gonna stop here. We still have like maybe a, a, a few minutes. So in case you have questions, we can discuss now. And again, so this is important concept, right? Hemizygous, because this gene, if you look at the, the male individual, this gene is only on the X chromosome. On Y chromosome, there's no such a gene there. So we only have one copy of the allele, hemizygous. Hi, Professor. Yep. Um, could you go back up and explain the penetrance one more time with that first example? Yeah, sure. I mean, here, right? Yes. Um, so uh, the one thing I wasn't understanding is it says there's a, a, a variable uh, penetrance. And so is there supposed to be the white in there or does it mean like, yeah, could you just like explain it one more time? Oh, sure, sure. So uh, when, we, when we talk about the pen penetrance rate, we talk about a specific population, right? So for example, in this population, uh, this is F1 population. Each one uh, has the identical genotype, right? So they are supposed to be uniformly expressed as the purple, fully, fully purple. But in this population, that's not the case. Only five out of nine showing the expected fully purple, right? So that's the penetrance rate for this population. But imagine you, if you repeat this experiment and generate another population, maybe that time you have six showing purple and three showing white. And in this case, when, when, when I ask you to calculate the penetrance rate for me, so this will become six out of nine, right? So you're gonna see the variability in the penetrance rates. So this is what I meant, the variable penetrance here. Oh, okay, that makes more sense. So mm -hmm. just to clarify, um, because every of them has the big B, it should all be purple, but because we have some white, we can calculate the penetrance rate, which would, for the first example, it will be five out of nine. And if it was like a different example, it would, like you said, on it would be six out of nine. That's right. The yes. one that shows, um, the purple, basically, for yes. this example. Oh, That's okay. right. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, got so, it. Uh, yeah, okay, sure, yeah. Any mm -hmm. other questions? Yeah, so I was saying the same slide. So expressivity-wise, um, do we see variable, like, of, like different levels of it because it's also environmental factors, or is yeah. that something else to do with genotype? Uh, right, so, so for example, this, right? So you see different levels of the expression of this trait. So the reason why it could, could be very complicated because, so that's why in the exam, I will only ask you on penetrance, trait, not the expressivity because it's, it's difficult to model that. But yeah, so the, 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 the reasons behind this is very complicated. So for example, um, um, so the genetics, the genotype will determine, basically will determine the phenotype, however, how much this phenotype is expressed may, 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 may be influenced by the environmental factors like the temperature. So, uh, so if, if, for example, if two flowers carrying the same genotypes, big B and small b, uh, if the flower, if, if this plant likes uh, the, the warm uh, temperature, if you put, put, put this, uh, the plant uh, in a warm uh, uh, environment, Probably, yeah, it can uh, make the metabol metabol metabolism uh, occurring faster than uh, the other one. If you put the other one in a cold, a cold, a cold environment, then it will uh, make the uh, the one uh, in the in the warm temperature produce more uh, pigment uh, than the other one. So 
in this case, you're going to see different level of the expression of okay, the so same it, gene. Yeah. And that's not the same as uh, having both variable penetrance and expressivity. Yeah, the third one, right? Yeah, is that the same thing as variable expressivity? Because it kind of looks very similar. Uh, yeah. So yes. So so I just so so this this are three examples. I I I just want to show you and help you to understand the concepts. So here we only uh, we only talk about the penetrance because every every single one is showing the phenotype have the same level, right? The fully one hundred percent of purple. But here uh, we only see uh, the expressivity because everyone is purple. That's what we expected. But the the level of the purple is different. However, when we move into the third uh, example, so I'm going to show you both. So in this in this example, you're going to see that the penetrance also show also the variable penetrance uh, penetrance rate. Also, you're going to show uh, you're going to see the the variability in the uh, expressivity, right? Okay. Um, sorry, one last question. And then within incomplete and variable penetrance. So incomplete is basically saying that. Um, if all individuals have the same uh, genotype, but then in some of them, you'll see that it doesn't even show the phenotype that it's supposed to. And right. then in variable, it's like everyone shows the genotype and the phenotype, but the phenotype is at different levels. That's right, yes. Okay. Very clear. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, very good. So, uh, so if you do not have questions, so let's stop here and uh, uh, have a good weekend. All right. Thank you, bye-bye.